One of the amazing things about the Buddha was his sense of what a human being was capable of. He looked at the pleasures he had and realized they were all subject to aging, illness, and death. He himself was subject to aging, illness, and death. And if you were looking for your happiness, looking for your fulfillment in things that are subject to aging, illness, and death, is it worth it? As he saw, everything that he might try to lay claim to had already been laid claim to by somebody else, which meant that you'd have to fight people off. He wondered if there was something that was better than that, something not subject to aging, illness, and death, something you didn't have to fight people to gain. And he found that there was, and he realized he wasn't the only person who could do that. Other people could find that same dimension as well. So you can imagine him looking at you and having high expectations for you, much higher than our society has. We tend to think that people are their feelings. The nature of feelings is you want to express them, and another nature of feelings is that your feelings may come into conflict with those of other people. So you try to manage things in such a way that you can express your feelings, because feelings like to be expressed without harming other people, without hurting other people's feelings. And for a lot of psychology, that's kind of the best that's expected. Get in touch with your feelings. Don't deny what they are. If you really feel lust, admit to yourself you feel lust, because that's you. If you feel anger, don't deny your anger, because that's you. Just learn how to express these things in harmless ways or relatively harmless ways, and then you die. That's it. What does the Buddha said? You're not your feelings. Feelings here, in terms of emotions, come under sankharas, fabrications, and the five aggregates. And he very clearly saw that there's a happiness to be found by letting go of these things. And he found that it was possible to get beyond your feelings. So when he says to kill your anger, he's not telling you to repress it. When he tells you to overcome lust, he's not telling you to re go into severe repression. Because after all, those things are not you or yours. They may be yours for the time being because you're laying claim to them, but you really have to. He saw there was a happiness that comes by letting go of these things. You're better off letting go. So we had a much larger view, a much larger sense of what human beings are capable of. And it's up to us to ask ourselves, which view do we prefer? Which provides more opportunities for a genuine happiness? Obviously the Buddhas. So when greed, aversion, and delusion arise, the Buddha would call them defilements. Modern psychology calls them us. So that's a big break right there. When greed comes up, when lust comes up, it's not necessarily anything that we have to identify with. When anger comes up, we don't have to identify with it. And in not expressing it and learning restraint around these things. We're not denying ourselves. We're redefining ourselves. And we don't pretend that they're not there. If you pretend that they're not there, then it gets unhealthy. You have to look them straight in the eye. And the best way to do that is to get the mind really quiet and to give it a pleasure that's not involved with sensuality. As the Buddha once said, 
if you don't have this higher level of pleasure, the pleasure that comes from concentration, getting the mind secluded from sensuality and unskillful thoughts, then no matter how much you may know about the drawbacks of sensuality, you're going to go back. That's precisely the problem of modern psychology. They don't, they don't know this higher pleasure. So you have to think that there's no way of getting out of your lust and your anger. So you might as well have to learn how to live with them. And the Buddha's teaching that you can learn to live without them. You have better things that you can do with your mind, first in the concentration, then with the insight. That allows you to let go. Being very frank with yourself about how these things arise, what causes them to arise, and how they pass away. They're not there all the time. Remember that image the Buddha gave of the, the mind being like the sun, and then the clouds come and obscure it. The clouds are not the sun. Now the sun here does not represent purity, it simply represents the fact that the mind can be aware. It doesn't have to be enslaved by its defilements, it doesn't have to be obscured by its defilements. It can use its awareness to reflect on them. This is how we find the Dharma, as the Buddha says, through commitment and then reflection. We commit to seeing how greed, aversion, and delusion come and how they go, why they come, why they go. And then we look at the allure. Why is it that when they go, we go back and dig them up again? What is it that we like about them? In some cases, we like the objects, say the object of lust. So the Buddha has us contemplated. Is it really worth it? Are you deceiving yourself as you find this attractive? Because all you have to do is take off a tiny little layer of skin, and you can't look at it at all. You take all the internal organs out, put them on the floor, we'd all run away. Another. So obviously there's some lying going on when lust arises. Then you turn around and look at the lust itself. Because that's where the real attraction lies. Often, as John Lee noted, the mind is sitting around, there's nothing to provoke it. It gets this desire to lust for something, gets a desire to be angry about something, then goes out and looks for an object, any object that it can take as an excuse. What is it that we find attractive about the lust? There's our identity around it. It's a huge issue now. People identify as this, identify as that. As the Buddha pointed out, there's just a lot of suffering there. That clinging is the identity. Even if you cling to a fluid identity, the fluidity becomes the object that you cling to. So you have to learn how to see all the narratives and other embroidery that you place on your, on your lust. That's a form of suffering. The same goes with anger. We may not like the object, the person who's gotten us angry, but we certainly like our anger. People get very defensive about it. when they're told, as the Buddha said, to kill their anger. They say, well, there's righteous anger. And righteous anger is probably one of the worst. There's a lot of attachment there. And it's perfectly possible to live in the world, see what's wrong with what's going on, and not be angry about it. In fact, the more matter-of-fact you are about what's wrong, then the more clearly you can see what can be done. To correct whatever's wrong. But there's a certain fire to anger. There's a certain sense of freedom that your shame and compunction get pushed aside. And you feel free to say anything that comes to your mind. The things that you wouldn't ordinarily want to say, you just say, okay, I now have the right to say it. Where does that right come from? Well, in the logic of anger, it comes from the fact that somebody else has done something outrageous. 
But the Buddha has you often reflect that what's the nature, say, of human speech? There's true speech and untrue speech. There's well-meaning speech and ill-meaning speech. There's truth. There's helpful speech and unhelpful speech. It's just the nature of human speech. So there's nothing extraordinarily out of line by things that are untrue and hurtful and unhelpful. So because they're not extraordinary, you don't get extraordinary rights to say and do and think what you want. And of course the problem is when you put aside your shame and compunction, then when they come back, you look at what you've done and said, there's a lot of regret. So you have to look at the allure of the anger and the lust, and you have to look at the, the drawbacks of these things. And remember what the Buddha said about where true happiness lies. You might be willing to develop a sense of dispassion toward the things that you were ordinarily passionate about, because you see it's simply not worth it. There's a better happiness that can be found. Now, if you didn't think there was that alternative, you wouldn't let go. This is why when the Buddha announced the Four Noble Truths that it is possible to put an end to suffering by putting an end to the cause, which is craving, and that there's a true happiness that comes about as a result. The texts tell us that when the Buddha taught that, there was an earthquake. Because that possibility shakes everything up. It's the possibility that is the reason why the Buddha has high expectations for human beings. We, we can do this. It is possible to find a dimension inside where there's no greed, aversion, or delusion, where there's nothing but happiness, well-being, that cannot be touched by space or time. You've got that capability. So don't allow the culture around you to get you to turn your back on it. Try to look at all your actions in the light of that possibility. Because it does leave open the possibility of genuine freedom. It's something that modern culture can't provide. But the Buddhist culture can.